Good morning. So this week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we have uh, our Kingdom Life Conference, uh, where we explore topics connected to living out our faith uh, in this already not yet world. We invite speakers to come um, and help us see with fresh eyes issues of culture, mind, and heart. And it is a, uh, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Joe Kikasola. Uh, Joe is the director of the Baylor in New York film program. He's written, yeah, Baylor, film. Uh, he has written books and articles on film and its intersection with epistemology, religion, metaphysics, um, he's directed and produced films and video projects around the world. Uh, he and his wife, Linnea, are 1994 Covenant College graduates. They live in Astoria, New York, and they have two children, Mateo and Bronwyn. Um, really quickly, uh, the way things will look, we'll have chapel today, tomorrow, and Wednesday. Tomorrow's chapel will be, if you have chapels you need to catch up on two credits for tomorrow's chapel so a double credit uh, tomorrow um, there will be a tea time where we'll do some uh, uh, Q&A and some more video clips tomorrow at 4 p.m. so now please give a warm Scots welcome to Dr. Joe Kikasola. thank you Grant I'm not speaking tomorrow unless you get four credits. That's all I'm saying. I mean. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. Can I pray? Lord God, in your great providence, you have loved us into this moment. Thank you for bringing us all here. May we hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so honored to be here. I'm particularly honored that Dr. Cliff Foreman is here, my very first film professor, and still the teacher of the very best film class I ever took. And I've taken a lot of them. And I've taught a lot of them, and I still think I'm chasing after what I experienced in that very course. Because that course, we went in real deep. And it was just a few students, the woman who became my wife, and me, and Cliff Foreman during a May term. He was so determined to teach this course at Covenant, he was willing to take it on with just two students, and I can't, I was just so privileged. I felt like I'd hit the lottery, right? We went in so deep on these things, and the world just opened up to me, and it became a career. What I do for a living is analyze films, and I try to get at the question of why they matter. So I'm particularly honored to talk about that with you here. For decades, film theorists have been trying to sort out what it is that makes film worthwhile. How do we explain its power? And why do we love it? And what value does it hold for us? And I want to get one thing out of the way here. The discussion about what is dangerous or perilous about film is a discussion worth having. It's a complicated one. And to let you in on my perspective on this, it's a danger that's not just present with film, it's present with any kind of cultural engagement, okay? I don't think film's a boogeyman in any particular way. But I'm not gonna talk about that right now. If you wanna talk about discernment, I'm very happy to do that in the talk back. It's an important topic, okay? But for the next three days, I wanna focus on this. Because this is the topic that usually doesn't get talked about. And um, it's a very, very important one. I think the gospel gives us confidence to live in our culture but it's hard to find this conversation. So I'm going to say, if film is a good part of God's creation, what precisely is good about it? Now, believe it or not, in asking this question, I'm actually following the lead of contemporary film theory, which, after decades of skepticism about just about everything, is starting to return to some fundamental questions that I can't help but ask. What is film good for? <clears throat> What's the value? You've got to understand, in academia in particular, questions of value have been suspended for decades because we couldn't decide if there was any standard for value. I didn't feel that way, but lots of others did. And now this book was released just a few months ago. There's 32 authors in it. I know most of them. Some of them I know very, very well, and I've spent lots of hours in conversation with them, and they're my friends. 
I care about them. Most of them are not believers. In most of these conversations, I'm the only Christian among them. But what I've found is that film gives us common ground to talk about what matters most to all of us. It's a starting point. How is it a starting point? That's the thing that's most interesting to me, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So my contribution to this discussion has a very distinctly Christian character. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to spend the next three days with you sharing a bit of that. Today I'm going to discuss the medium in its most fundamental terms, how its considerable powers situate us and put us through experiences, what I would call felt life, revealing both our powers and limitations, as well as how we feel about our powers and limitations. And of course, this has massive spiritual importance to us, because in the end, the best films are like a kind of simulation or a, rehearse, a rehearsal of our lived experiences. They function as like a spiritual gymnasium wherein we can exercise our minds and our hearts and our affections and our bodily responses in a very focused fashion and guide us to proper reflection on ourselves, the world, and yes, on God. Now tomorrow, I'm going to take the concepts I talk about today and apply it personally. I'm going to tell you my personal journey with the film Sound of Metal, which happened to me just two years ago. And I'll tell you a bit about that story and why it was important to me. On Wednesday, I'm going to focus on our experience of time, which is a dynamic that the August, Augustine of Hippo found to be shot through with mystery and spiritual import, and that the cinema is specifically adept at addressing. So let's dig in here. God has set eternity in our hearts. He made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart, but no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. This truth is both glorious and challenging because it's a fundamental tension of being human. We know, but we don't fully know. We're here, but we're not fully where we need to be. We haven't mastered God, and of course, our great temptation is to master God. And the great secret to happiness, I believe, is to find our place as God's child, not His master. Film helps us to understand this tension. In fact, our lives are defined by it. Look at this quote from Kierkegaard. What is existence? Existence is the child that is born of the infinite and the finite, the eternal and the temporal, and it's therefore a constant striving. If we want to pick a, a more focused theologian, A.W. Tozer, true religion confronts earth with heaven and brings eternity to bear upon time. That is going to be a theme throughout these three days. Film helps us to understand this tension in our bodies and in our minds and as, as a psychophysical unity. More to the point, it helps us understand that the tensions in our bodies point to this spiritual truth, that we are creatures living in this tension, and we need to find how to live in that tension. As a Christian, I'm suggesting to you, the cinema gives us insight into who we are, our powers and limitations, and who God is, who has all power and no limitations, and what one has to do with the other. It did that for me in one of my very first cinematic experiences, which, as it happens, was also one of my very first spiritual experiences. I assume you've seen this one. I was six years old. I was utterly blown away within the first minute. That screen, so filled with stars, was incredibly vast and beyond calculation. And then this imperial cruiser flies over my head for days until my whole body was rumbling with fear and anticipation. I had never seen anything like it. I had no way to anticipate what was next, and I felt so very, very, very small. Now, how do I explain this experience? The dominant feeling for me was immensity. This is the concept that we only know through experience, really. It's in the feeling, primarily, that the knowing matters. So I probably heard the word immensity before, but I didn't know it at all until then. Now, with these sorts of meanings that are corporeal, bodily felt and carried and executed, artistic experiences really excel at bridging the gap for us. 
Alexander Baumgarten on aesthetic knowledge. Scientium sensitive quod cognoscendi. Pardon my Latin. I'm sure I mangled that, right? <laughs> this is a summary or a paraphrase of what uh, we think he might have meant by that, Gabriel Starr anyway. Aesthetic experience is a blend of sensation and knowledge such that we almost feel thought itself. Now you're saying what I'm doing here, I'm saying to you that feelings matter. They matter a lot. Not every feeling, but some feelings carry a tremendous amount of weight it's to the point where we would call it knowledge. And Star Wars did this for me. It was the largest screen I'd ever beheld, and it made me think about how big God is. He's bigger than all those stars. How big could evil be, whoever's in that ship? I, re I received the cosmic truth of my own finitude, and I received it in my body. The very serious threat of evil and the expansiveness of God's majesty. I needed to know those things at six years old. It was a reference point in feeling for me, a somatic touchstone for an immensity that exceeded what I had ever experienced. I still need that touchstone. I still need to be reminded that I don't master anything, and there's always something bigger. When you begin to feel yourself at the limits of your feeling and your sense, and see there's a vast country way beyond that, that's what we call a liminal or threshold experience. Now, Star Wars might seem to be trivial to you, and as I've gotten older, I have to admit, the script and the acting is pretty bad. But for me, it was formative. And in fact, the whole idea that we're shaped by experiences at the, is the heart of what we mean by formation. And this is precisely what Jamie Smith means and what he's getting at when he says that Christian education needs to attend to the heart and not just the head, to liturgies and spiritual practices and not just doctrine and ideas. And that's from a philosopher. <clears throat> the whole idea that we might know something in our bodies is an old idea, but the idea heavy enlightenment has really held the mic for a very, very long time. And it's really only in the last few decades that thinkers have started to turn back to the body in earnest with a sophistication that truly marries the head and the heart and doesn't treat one or the other as an ugly stepchild. Now, I don't have time to survey a bunch of thinkers that have informed me, but here's a few ideas that are really going to inform my talks in the next three days. Cinema is multisensory and works at various levels and degrees, and what that means is it enables us to participate at a certain level in the drama that's happening on screen. You are actually living into the screen at a certain level. I have to qualify that, but I don't have time to qualify it all the ways it needs to be qualified. But what I'm telling you is it's more than you sitting and passively taking in information. You're living in that experience. Corporeal meaning counts. It's epistemologically heavy. Epistemologically, 50 cent word, knowledge. It's real knowledge. Some have argued, like Mark Johnson, these books really had a profound impact on me, is that most knowledge stems from bodily experience first. So I the idea of the concept of a, cart a container a baby understands a container before he or she knows the word container because you, they feel containers. There's an inside and there's an outside. And you play with the blocks, you put them in and take them back out. The concept of inside and outside is grasped without any words to describe that. It is a corporeal sort of knowledge. Johnson goes so far as to say all of languages like this, grounded in experience. I don't know if I go with him that far but it reestablishes experience as really important. And nothing, nothing traffics in experiences like cinema. The thing about experience is we can feel like we already know everything because we've experienced it. But that's exactly the opposite of what happens. Your body is built to reduce information. Otherwise, you'd be overwhelmed. I could never live in New York City if I really remembered everything I experienced. My brain has to pare it down to the most essentials. Don't get hit by the taxi and find out where the hot dog stand is. And make sure you know where the next bathroom is. Those are the three essentials in New York City, right? But there's so much more to New York City than that, right? What happens with experience is we trick ourselves into thinking, yeah, I already know that. What art does is disrupts habit. Habitualization devours work and clothes and furniture, one's wife and the fear of war. You think you've overcome all of those things. But art exists that we might recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stony. There's nothing that reminds you 
of the stone being stony when you get hit by a stone, right? It's a very, very different kind of knowledge. The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they're perceived, not as they're known. This is from Viktor Shklovsky, uh, the Russian formalist critic 100 years ago. I'd just, just take issue with his known. I know what he means by that. What we think we knew. What film can do, what art can do, painting, literature, all of it, can help us to recall and bring back and reanimate those, sense, those sensory knowledge experiences that we had so the stone can become stony again or the faith can become marvelous again. I just want to give you a short little example that we can walk through. Um, I picked this example, this documentary, which premiered at Sundance. It's very short. Uh, you're only going to see the first two minutes of it. Um, but it's very, very basic, and I love how it just gets to the basic elements of cinema, right? And yet, it still works so well, at least in my experience. We'll see what you think. Um, and this will be a way of unpacking some of these ideas. So would you play the clip, please? Jag vill inte vara sån, men det är lite högre än vad det ser ut. Alltså. Nej, för fan, jag vågar inte. Ten meters is about thirty feet up. So, um, now I've shown this film many times to many different audiences, large and small, and it never fails. Every single time, everyone always laughs when the woman says "forget it" and storms off swearing. And there's always a gasp when the little girl goes over the edge. Always. Why? Isn't it amazing? that we can emotionally lock into these total strangers with no background information. We don't even see the water. So little information, but I continue to ask why. More importantly, why does it matter? There's a lot of reasons, but I've intimated here, part of the reason is that film has the power to enact some kind of fundamental lived truth about living as a human being and our aspirations and our limits. As a Christian, all those limits and aspirations are within a theological frame. To get a sense of what I mean, consider Augustine. Who should understand this? Who shall relate to it? What is that light that shines upon me, but not continuously, and strikes upon my heart with no wounding? I draw back in terror. I'm on fire with longing. Terror insofar as I'm different from it, and longing in the degree of my likeness to it. Now, what Augustine came to understand is that the terror of being unlike God was an appropriate response, and in many ways, it was the only possible response, much like our Swedish subjects perched on the edge of a 10-meter diving tower. And some simply can't get past that terror, but others, by God's grace, heed the call beyond the edge. 
Now, as we all know, this encounter with God that Augustine so vividly describes in this language of feeling and presence isn't the end of his story. In fact, it's just the beginning of his conversion. He was emotionally tormented by all kinds of intellectual questions until he threw himself on the ground and said, oh, Lord, how long? And then he heard a child's voice. He says, I don't know if it was a boy or a girl, a voice of a child from somewhere saying, pick it up read it. And so he picks up the Word of God, and he reads Romans 13, and in his words he says, I was pierced by the love of God. Do you hear how dynamic and sensuous that language is? Do you see how his conversion is the whole package, the whole complex web of human experience? The rational, the intellectual, the theological questions, all tangled up with emotions and need and sensation and presence and absence and fear and joy, all manner of experience. Do you see how being human is a constant striving? and how eternity presses into the temporal for Augustine? Can you start to see why God gave us the arts and why we should all study and practice them at some level? Shout out to the art department, music department, literature people. (laughs) This opening scene of this film sets us up with two frames that are both true. We're not made to fly through the air, and yet we have this crazy idea that maybe we could or maybe we should. And if we have the faith of a child. Ah. We're waiting with anticipation to be more than what we are. That anticipation might be fearful, it might be hopeful, it might be a mix of the two, but we wait actively. We're either waiting in terror or faith, but both of those are in negotiation with powers that are bigger than ourselves. Kierkegaard even talked about the leap of faith. Now, I'm not saying film is best at giving us Sunday school illustrations. What I'm saying is that Augustine suggests our foundational experience of God is a kind of tension, and that tension at its core is felt. We fall to the ground before the holy God of the universe, and yet, at the same time, our deepest desire is to jump into His lap and be wrapped in His arms. This film gives us a felt reference point for both of those truths that are very hard to hold in tension our feeling of limits, and our impulses towards transcendence. And it's that economy of experiences within you that tells you something about who you are and what you truly desire. And it's that kind of economy of experiences that we will build on as we seek theological mysteries that are much harder to grasp. And that's a topic I'll, I'll visit on Wednesday. God made creation for our delight. It really is enough that we enjoy it, and it is our responsibility to steward it. We don't have to give more theological justification than that. But what I've also tried to do here is show you that when we interrogate why those things are pleasurable, and film helps us do that, we can find film helpful in revealing how God has constructed us for living as temporal creatures with eternity in our hearts. Our knowledge of God is not just in our heads or bound by the words we say or the words we read. Our knowledge of who we are and who God is is also stored in our bodies. And to see this film as a Christian is to read it as something more than just a documentation of this or that person jumping off a tower. It is to revisit your own bodily knowledge of your own limits, your own fears, and the rewards of faith the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Taste and see the Lord is good. The Lord is good. He really is. But you don't know that until you taste it. And I hope you will. Please hear me. Film can't save us. Only God can save us. No film guarantees to give us anything at all, but it can be a marvelous aid to our spiritual formation by examining, testing, expanding our God-given world of lived experience. And like everything else in human culture, there is good to be enjoyed and used for our good and for our knowledge of ourselves and others and for the Lord Himself. And if you felt like you once knew these things, or you forgot them, and you don't have access to them, and your faith is just hanging on to an idea or a thread of an idea, maybe with some spiritual vision you can quiet your heart, and you can pray, and you can maybe pick up a movie and see it through a theological lens, because maybe God is speaking to you through your rehearsed lived experiences, and maybe the stone can feel stony again for you even a rock of salvation. 
And maybe it can help you to remember to retrieve in your bones and muscles and nerves the critical lived truths that you have forgotten and ignored, your unacknowledged fears and impediments to godliness, and help you rediscover something of what it means to live and not just think, to explore the abundance that Christ has promised you. And I encourage you to seek that out, embrace the feelings and experience of faith not to the exclusion of the rational dimension of belief or the doctrines, the knowledge of the Scriptures, theological debates, all that is critical, but it must be a partnership. What the th Rudolf Otto, the theologian, called the warp and the woof of the fabric of faith. They work together to make a tapestry, the rational, the non-rational, or the experiential dimensions. And you're seeking out you need not restrict your experiences of God to the church and its culture. All of creation is His, and He is not silent. Jonathan Edwards, there is a difference between believing that God is holy and gracious and having a new sense on the heart of the loveliness and beauty of that holiness and grace. The difference between believing that God is gracious and tasting that God is gracious is as different as having a rational belief that honey is sweet and having the actual sense of its sweetness. Brothers and sisters, may you taste the goodness of God today. And to borrow one of Edward's very favorite oft-used phrases, may you be utterly swallowed up in His grace. Thank you. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, you are sweet, you are good. We wait for you to visit us in every way. In the times when our feelings and emotions aren't enough, give us your word. In the times when our minds are not enough, give us that visitation, that visitation from the Spirit or from a friend or a work of art or a community of believers, something that will make us feel your presence. We thank you that you have made us as we are and that you give us all we need. You are sufficient, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.